So welcome everybody to the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science and to the Anthropocene Lecture Series. My name is Lino Camprubi and I work here at the Research Group Epistemes of Modern Acoustics, which doesn't belong to any of the three big departments of the Institute. If you don't know the Institute, I'm not going to explain its structure to you, but you're welcome anytime to ask. Um, the Anthropocene Lecture Series started about a year ago and it meets about once a month to discuss this very tricky and slippery concept. It's organized by Department One in the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, by the Haus der Kulturen der Welt here in Berlin, and by the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies, which is in Potsdam. And presenting the, well, it has, I, I mean, I'm sure if you're here is because you already know the series, uh, you've been probably in one or two talks. It has invited people like Julia Thomas or Bruno Latour and all kinds of speakers and audience have been involved from the most um, enthusiastic to the most skeptical to the many opportunists and all, all ranges of possibilities. And um, today we have a very distinguished speaker who is going to be introduced by Stefan uh, Schaeffer, Schaeffer, who works in the Institute for Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, and he's the person in charge of the series from that institute. He works mostly, among other things, on climate engineering. Um, I think that's, well, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. He's also, he's also, yeah, no, because that's, that's the link, no. He's also working in Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> at the at the program led by Sheila there, so that's why he's going to be presenting her and doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, Lino. Yes, and indeed, uh, the reason I could convince Sheila uh, to come here, perhaps, is among other things that I'm currently a visiting fellow in uh, her program at Harvard, uh, the program on uh, science technology and uh, 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 on science technology studies there. So uh, thank you, Lino, for uh, welcoming us uh, to the uh, Max Planck Institute for the History of Science and for presenting the Anthropocene Lecture Series, uh, and also for the uh, sustained collaboration uh, on that series with this house and the House of World Cultures in uh, Berlin. And good afternoon to you, everyone, uh, and a very warm welcome also from my side. And it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Sheila Jasanoff. Uh, Professor Jasanoff is the Pforzheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at Harvard University and a pioneer in the field of science and technology studies. She has worked for decades to develop both approaches to and infrastructures for sustained inquiry into the role of science and technology in society. Her scholarly contributions and commitments to community building have provided generations of scholars not just with an intellectual framework to develop their own work, but with a strong community of highly supportive friends and colleagues. At Cornell University, uh, Professor Jasanoff transformed the Modest Research Program at the time into the prominent Department of Science and Technology Studies and served as its founding chair. Having moved to Harvard in 1998, Professor Jasanoff founded and continues to direct the program on science, technology, and society, a lively, communal, and intellectually rigorous program that brings together 15 to 20 doctoral and postdoctoral researchers every academic year under Professor Jasanoff's mentorship. Uh, in 2002, Professor Jasanoff established the Science and Democracy Network, the SDN, uh, which holds alternate annual meetings in Europe and at Harvard, and this year's meeting will be taking place later this week in Munich. In her scholarship, Professor Jasanoff has developed a systematic body of work that speaks to the most pressing public concerns of our time. Her work probes how ruling institutions justify the exercise of power and authority in contemporary democracies, how visions of progress shape cult shape practices of public justification, how the production, testing, and putting to use of knowledge follows culturally specific expectations and forms of sense-making in different national contexts, uh, how the global is made to be a space of scientific, technological, and political rule, and how knowledge and power emerge together through simultaneous processes of meaning giving. So these are among the wide range of problems that Professor Jasanoff's work elucidates, and they find elaboration in concepts and approaches, such as co-production, civic epistemologies, bioconstitutionalism, and socio-technical imaginaries, that have shaped the field of science and technology studies in fundamental ways. 
Together they amount to a distinctive and path-breaking theorization of the nature of public reason. Professor Jasanoff's theoretical contributions, for example, in books such as The Fifth Branch, Science at the Bar, States of Knowledge, Designs on Nature, Dreamscapes of Modernity, and most recently, The Ethics of Invention, to name just a selection, are among the most eminent in the sociology of knowledge and are certainly unparalleled in the sociology of public knowledge. Of course, Professor Jasanoff's achievements have been recognized by numerous award committees. Prizes she received include, among others, the Bernal Prize of the Society for Social Studies of Science, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the 2018 Albert O. Hirschman Prize from the, Social, uh, from the Social Science Research Council. And now I ask you to please join me in welcoming Sheila Jasanoff, who will tonight speak about the human imprint, nature, time, and law in the Anthropocene. Thank you, Stefan, for that completely unnecessary introduction. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I had a, a, a chastening experience. Uh, people like being introduced, of course, so, you know, I do appreciate that side of it. But uh, somebody from the audience, after I had done, you know, quite a bravura set of introductions, said to me, uh, you took away time from when those people could have been talking because you can look all this up on the internet anyway. Uh, I did point out to the person that it was more to placate the distinguished guests, but he was not yet of a stature to appreciate that. Um, anyway, uh, I'm addressing you on this topic with a lot of hesitation because there are people in this audience who uh, have been working on something called the Anthropocene. There are people who've been coming to a lecture series, and I am, in a sense, an interloper, and an interloper for a set of reasons. Um, I've never liked going where the buzzwords are. And then I've had, as a program builder and intellectual developer of things, I've been in this constant tension because, of course, the money, the money is where the buzzwords are, and if you want to get a grant, you have to go do that. But, I mean, right now it's artificial intelligence. Anthropocene is already so passé. But in, in any case, um, there are, of course, lots of people talking about the Anthropocene, and I have this deep urge not to. Uh, so how does one mesh those two things? things, on the one hand, recognizing that if people are thinking about something, then of necessity there is something there to be thought about, but maybe not in the way in which people who are in the thick of it are thinking about it. So one, I mean, on a separate strand in connection with my work on biotechnology, genetics, genomics, I've just finished writing a small book, which is, uh, it has the grandiose title, Can Science Make Sense of Life? Uh, and it will be appearing later this year. And the argument, of course, is not a straight yes or no. It's more a reflection on how science gets to be seen as that thing that makes sense of very important phenomena, in this case, Anthropocene as the new term, the new framing concept for human nature relationships, which of course, like life itself, has been on the minds of people for a very long time. Um, so how is it that a new concept such as the Anthropocene comes in and colonizes in a way our field of vision so that if we want to talk about that thing, now we have to go through a set of rooms, a mansion, an architecture, a city, whatever, called Anthropocene. And what is at stake in being redirected in those ways? So that's, uh, if you will, the kind of broad uh, backdrop of uh, concerns, reflections, out of which I want to talk to you. So, of course, it's well known that, in a way, the talking about the Anthropocene became possible because of um, a set of developments which many people have taken back to uh, the Cold War, the military-industrial complex, the space race, and the um, transformative moment 
uh, at which it is said that we began to see the planet for the first time from outer space. Now, nobody who studied cartography would believe that because there are wonderful 17th century maps that actually display the Earth kind of looking like that. But, of course, they were not so prevalent. This image has become kind of the Mona Lisa of modernity. It's used as the face on which people inscribe various things, which today would be called memes, I suppose. But, you know, it's universally recognized. People have forgotten that it actually came about kind of accidentally from astronauts holding their handheld cameras and looking back on Earth and taking the picture. But from that, certain things became... Uh, at least obvious to talk about, the boundedness of the planet and the wholeness of the planet. And people, I think, semi-legitimately talk about how there was a shift in our scalar understanding of environmental problems and to some degree also of temporality. Uh, so space and time sort of going together uh, as bumped up from the sorts of things we thought we knew in a much more local way. Uh, the example that illustrates this par excellence is the move from weather, which we all uh, thought we understood, but somehow gave over to the British to talk about. Um, and in place of that, today, we have climate. So the weather to climate shift is emblematic of a lot of other shifts. And of course, it's again well known in this audience that at the turn of the century, a Nobel Prize winning scientist who had previously already been talking about global change uh, kind of accidentally in this rather modest looking newsletter uh, coined the term the Anthropocene. Uh, obviously not realizing in that moment that he was going to put a fashionable word into discourse, and that's Paul Crutzen, and this is the uh, Global Change Newsletter number 41 of 2000 of such modest beginnings are intellectual revolutions made. Um, it was from the start of Bonanza for Science. I mean, so people jumped on this bandwagon because many people in different fields of science saw a whole set of questions opening up. Uh, among other things, just when do you date this phenomenon from? So anyone who was doing stratigraphy was immediately attracted to the Anthropocene. Um, and anyone, again, who had been looking at uh, facial changes on the surface of the earth, anything particularly in this part of Germany, of course, uh, one doesn't have to go far to discover uh, the traces of large-scale uh, human interferences with the earth's surface. And, uh, you know, this kind of headline is if not quite a dime a dozen, very prevalent in the, in the literature. So the epoch was as much an, a discovery period opening up for science as anything else. Uh, and, you know, very soon, uh, you know, an entire literature springs up. Uh, the, um, and you can already see something of the of the variation in the styles of ways in which people are approaching it from, uh, you know, historical studies such as the shock of the Anthropocene to uh, more philosophical reflections, learning to die in the Anthropocene. Um, but at the same time, other kinds of visual depictions start appearing on the scene. Um, and this one relates to temporality. So it's a beautiful image. It, uh, of course, looks like a Schnecke, um, but uh, it's not edible. Uh, and it gives you slices of time. Um, and, you know, by any measure, this thing called the Anthropocene is a very tiny blink in the eye of eternity. So what should we make of this? I mean, how is something that is so short you know, the word in circulation since 2000, a period of time that is, you know, a blink in the surface of our existence on the earth. Um, where do we put it? Where do we locate it in relation to how we understand ourselves 
in relation to nature and the world. So it's worth thinking back of, you know, what imprint civilization has made and just how young that is. Uh, so, of course, this is all contested territory, but humans start appearing something, you know, between 200,000 to 150,000 years ago, and cultural traces start appearing much more recently, 40, 35,000 to 40,000 years ago. And, you know, this is the famous cave of dreams uh, where you see these beautiful images, you know, one of the earliest renditions of humans reflecting on their own connection to nature and natural objects. And one of the most discussed such things, I mean, it's 5,000 years and we don't have any idea what it even stands for. So to the extent that humans have been interacting with nature, making meaning out of works of art, uh, we don't really understand what these works are about. I mean, you know, you can fill an entire room of this size with books about the meaning of Stonehenge, and yet we kind of presume to understand what the meaning of the Anthropocene is. Um, surely there's something paradoxical already there. Um, at the same time, it is very much a cultural icon, and things have been appropriated. Human artworks uh, have been appropriated in strange and, and you know, rather magnificent ways to show how different our understanding of the world has become as a result of this sense that we are making it. So this is Hokusai's famous uh, depiction of the tsunami wave, but here is what somebody did with it, with the something called the Plastic Ocean Project, um, and, you know, microplastics are one of those things, another of these buzzwordy things that's very much coalescing our ideas about how we are affecting um, um, the planet, you know, in some thoroughgoing sort of way. Uh, so, you know, deep penetration attempts to make meaning. Not surprisingly, I mean, just before I came into this lecture room, we were having a discussion about... Is it important, why is it important to have common language to talk about, uh, given the condition that American politics is in these days? Uh, one hears a lot of times from you know, people like my colleagues at Harvard how the entire floor has been ripped out from underneath <laughs> democracy because we no longer have words that have the same meaning. Um, but it's not quite as simple-minded as that because, of course, even a word like democracy uh, has been around with us for thousands and thousands of years, and people don't agree on what the meaning is. So when we agree to talk about things, it's not that we agree on what the meaning is. We agree that it's important to talk about it, but that is a different impetus. I mean, why do we agree that it's important to talk about it? And already around the Anthropocene, I think one is seeing, if one is interested in creating binaries, different discourses, discourses of hope, discourses of fear, that stress different things about what is at stake in understanding human nature relations in terms of something that we want to call the Anthropocene. So on the hope side, Look, if we're changing the world, great. We can also change it with intention and design, and let's be techno-optimists and environmental modernists, and there's a whole set of things that we can point to, that we can promise things and actually bring them about, like the Apollo mission that gave us those images, that we can rely on science, that we can make precise changes witness the extreme enthusiasm about genome editing that has grasped the entire biotech world, that we can control things if it's technological interventions made by humans into the Earth, then the entire Earth becomes, after all, a plaything that we can control and manage with precision technologies that will gain exponentially in power. And on the other side, we have a similar sort of a set of ideas 
but that point much more to catastrophic outcomes. And almost point by point, one can juxtapose against the promissory notes, the, uh, but there's hell to pay on the other side. So whereas the techno-optimists see promise and conquest, the techno-pessimists say hubris. So, I mean, it's not that people have taken Anthropocene and said, I am now going to put it into the techno-optimist frame and look, here are the things. But it's interesting that these techno-optimist and pessimist discourses, even in the social sciences, as I'll point out in a minute, are reverberating around this way of understanding the Earth and the planet and everything that's happening on it as imprinted by what we do as human beings and human societies. Um, so, of course, one of these people is mentioned wherever I go. So I will not name him. Um, the other one was a dear friend of mine and unfortunately has left the earth as Ulrich Beck. But it's interesting to see how both of them, who were both taken very much by the idea of, of the Anthropocene, parsed out the sort of underlying ideas of the Anthropocene in, in quite different discursive registers, which to some extent fit the binary that I was talking about. So, <coughs> literally parsing what are some of the themes that the Latour-Beck confrontation, in a way, which didn't happen to my knowledge, you know, in, in a sort of facial standoff, uh, what kinds of themes do they focus on? So who's the we and what's the our and environment? So if one says Anthropocene, it has Anthropos, uh, seemingly a homogeneous kind of cultural formation. And there's a single environment that's captured in the scene part of it. Um, but who is that we? And if one looks at Latour's famous essay on loving, loving our monsters, one can get some idea of, for him, who the we is. So today we, we can fold ourselves into the molecular machinery of soil bacteria through our sciences and technologies. We run robots on Mars. We photograph and dream of further galaxies. And yet we fear that the climate could destroy us. You know, I come from India. I can tell you that for most Indians, we run robots on Mars probably would not be a true statement. Um, maybe we run on the coattails of some people who run robots on Mars, but that is a quite different place from which to think about the we. Um, Beck, in his Anthropological Shock essay, talks about we in a different way. I mean, so whereas Latour's we's are the doers, the enablers, the people who control time, past, and future, um, dream of further galaxies. There's a lot of temporality in this language. Uh, Bex is more backward looking and it's a narrative of loss. The we are united by being disenfranchised. In nuclear democracy, we the citizens have lost sovereignty over our senses and thus residual sovereignty over our judgment. So this is a disenlightenment. If the enlightenment was acquiring greater judgment and Mündigkeit. This is the opposite phenomenon in the Beckian universe. What about the costs and benefits of our intrusions into the planet? Um, for Latour, it's a creation of a new kind of stewardship, uh, a kind of stewardship in which technology is important, our costly instruments, and all our hundreds of thousands of scientists, something to celebrate because nature needs this constant care. So the Anthropocene is a period of gardening. It's a period of gardening in which we've given over the gardening instinct, as Sigmund Bauman once referred to it, to the scientists because nature, nature reconfigured by humans, now needs the scientists to help us do the caretaking. And with Beck, one sees that 
our relation to reality has been fundamentally transformed. But what he's talking about is not our reality having been transformed because we now have created the cadre of caretakers because they are able to go out and look after this nature that after all is ours now and not inherited from some other age, but rather a, a falling away from Eden kind of story. So what about responsibility? Um, once again, the sin is not to wish to have dominion over nature, but to believe that this dominion means emancipation and not attachment. So an even closer entanglement is what one wants to see in the Luturian universe, whereas in the Beckian universe, uh, suddenly something else rears its ugly, ugly head. So for instance, capitalist firms would thus be confronted with the necessity of demonstrating the harmlessness of their materials. <coughs> That's a very different idea from increasing dominion through attachment. And then what about the ethical obligations? Um, and again, for Latour, the ethical obligations are simply to scale up, to do more of what we were doing, and to do it more aggressively ever increasing scale, namely intervening, acting, wanting, and caring. Uh, but for some people, intervening, acting, and wanting have been thought of as on a different plane and antithetical to caring. And again, if one looks at Beck, one finds a very different idea in which uh, responsibility demands that people face off against each other, that the scientists actually question each other. And, um, you know, until it can become externally comprehensible, externally comprehensible, so comprehensible to some other people by implication, which genie is in the bottle here. So here you see two major social thinkers, both of them preoccupied with the Anthropocene, uh, both of them reflecting on what it means that we now are interwoven with nature in these fundamental ways, but with very different ideas of what kinds of collectives are being made as a result, what the responsibility of those collectives is, where science sits in relation to collective responsibilities, and what kind of ethics we should be thinking about in the Anthropocene. Now, both of these are universalist narratives, and this is where, you know, so I do think we need to understand why people are gripped by these stories, by the story of the Anthropocene, and in part it allows this construction of the grand narrative. But what do the grand narratives miss? These are profoundly normatively imbued stories that you get from the people who are writing about the Anthropocene. But other than the sort of brief mention of capitalism in the quotes, I mean, of course, I'm picking out selective quotes to show the, the antithesis between two very prominent thinkers. But still, I think if one probes, one finds that other kinds of human constructs don't appear nearly so much as technology. So it's all focused on us, nature, technology, and technology then being the creative potential, which previously we used to let sit with religion or somewhere else. But other creations of human societies do not feature. And of course, for me, one of the creations of human society that I think needs to be in conversation is the law. So where is the law? As a source of norms, why is it so strangely absent in the discourses of the Anthropocene? And it shouldn't be, because the law has engaged with precisely these kinds of questions of responsibility and of causality and of our connections to nature for eons. Um, not that long ago, maybe 130 to 100 years ago, um, our understanding of human nature relationships was not that we didn't affect nature, everybody understood that we affected nature all the time, but that we didn't need to care until the problem was really on top of us. 
imminent. So imminence was the standard that the law laid down for how we should care about the way that the ways in which we relate to nature. Um, here is an amusing case from 1885 in which a downstream landowner was complaining that the upstream landowner and alkali manufacturer was, going, was producing discharges of a very noxious character from his waste heaps, and these would continue flowing for 40 years or more, and if this liquid should find its way into the river, to any appreciable extent, the water would be rendered unfit for the plaintiff's manufacturer, manufacture, and his trade would be ruined. And the judge has nothing wants nothing of it, because the standard in the law for should you care about this, should you care about the passage of 40 years, is no, you should not care, because it's too long a period of time. And the harm is therefore not practically certain to occur. It's somewhere off in the distance. And so he says, the judge says, I think that in 10 years' time, it is highly probable that science, which is at work on the subject, may have discovered some means for rendering this green liquid innocuous. Uh, so, you know, there's a set of interactions that you will see without my needing to parse it out in detail between capital, technological innovation, disruption in those days, though the term is anachronistic, and what we should be doing in thinking about it. And you might ask yourself, which of our social thinkers does this echo and which not? Well, so imminence was all very fine, but then we started worrying about other things as we, as other kinds of sciences gained ground, and obviously one of them was ecology and understanding the complex ways in which we relate to one another. And so people have been predicting catastrophes on a much different scale from the climate catastrophe for some time. So this one is about insects. In his book, The Creation, the world's most celebrated biologist, E.O. Wilson, has spelled out what would happen if the vortex swallowed insects. So Again, look at the temporality. In two or three centuries, with humans gone, the ecosystems of the world would regenerate back to the rich state of near equilibrium that existed 10,000 or so years ago. But if insects were to vanish, the terrestrial environment would soon collapse into chaos. So this is a different way of thinking about the Anthropocene. This is one that says, OK, so humans have made this, but one of the possible ways of thinking about it is that the catastrophe only affects the humans anyway. And if the humans die off, we just go back to status quo. Because, well, I mean, I don't know about 10,000 years ago, but, you know, that we're actually better off, that the insects are less likely, at least if they're beetles and cockroaches, they're less likely to vanish than we ourselves. So E.O. Wilson might not be quite so upset at the kinds of catastrophist uh, scenarios, except that they affect his beloved insects. Um, but we don't know anything about this. And so lots of people, especially in this country, have been worried about bees and their die-offs for quite some time, and really throughout Europe. Um, and why is that happening? So here is a place where we get the signal that as bee colonies are dying and collapsing, but we don't actually know what the answers are. Many think it likely that a combination of factors is at work, pesticides perhaps weakening the bees' immune systems, rendering them defenseless against common pests and diseases. It's the classic kind of case, you know, frog, sterility is another such case, that is the canary in the coal mine, except that we don't know what the coal mine is or exactly what the canaries are suffering from. We just know that there's signals coming back from the world that we don't know how to interpret. Um, so this is a way in which the Anthropocene works. It's not just a matter of going out into physical space and taking a picture showing you that we are holistic and intertwined. If any of you are aficionados of the book of the report, Our Common Future, you know that they talk about this stylized pattern of greenery and clouds, and you know that it's obvious they're thinking about it at that level. Here we're talking about something much more 
commonplace. We're talking about whether bees can be kept in ways that will allow organic honey makers to produce organic honey and, you know, a mundane set of things that are being thrown off kilter. So that arouses questions of stewardship from a different angle. And that angle has been itself translated into law and public policy in a variety of ways, and that is the idea of precaution. So one way of thinking, how have we reacted normatively to not the Anthropocene, but to the understanding of human nature relationships, one might point out that in the middle of the 20th century or in the latter third of the 20th century, it's not only that we saw our planet from space for the first time, quote unquote, but also that we began to think about precaution because we were already aware from these other kinds of signals that things were out of kilter and something needed to be done. So by the end of the century, there are these uh, statements of the precautionary principle or the precautionary approach taking shape in various collective bodies that have a lot of bearing on law and public policy. Um, the US, as some of you may know, is uh, you know, almost viscerally resistant to the idea of precaution. Uh, and pins it on Europe, that this is, you know, along with all the other vices of unpasteurized cheese and what have you, uh, there is also this uh, peculiar uh, embrace of precaution, which is a bad thing, because, of course, one should seize the future with both hands, whereas precaution is backward-looking. So there's a construction of temporality somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic that Europe is the backward-looking place, always thinking about loss and what has been, whereas America is the forward-looking place, you know, creating the future. But one of the most precautionary statutes of all time was the very first major American legislation that was the federal intervention into environmental policy in the 1969 National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, which says that all agencies of the federal government must conduct for every major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the human environment an environmental impact statement, and that should call attention to unavoidable adverse environmental effects and alternatives to the proposed action. So point by point, that 1969 law, which became the cornerstone of American environmental policy, actually embraces a different kind of idea of stewardship. And echoing Beck's point about how things have to be made externally comprehensible and visible, NEPA demands not just that governments carry out their reasoning sitting off somewhere, but that this be done in public with explanations. So when you stay sort of focused on technology and what it can do for you, you're ignoring this entire other dimension of meaning making that is for whom are you creating the technology and the futures and who else gets to talk about it in any reasonable way at all. And for that, to some degree, you don't talk to the technology and society people, you go and talk to the law people who are imagining what futures we want, whether it's in relation to technology or not. Since then, of course, and before, since before then, the precautionary principle has appeared in all kinds of different places. Again, this is simply a roundup to show that this is not just a trivial idea. It is an idea that has won some traction, that actually is a way of thinking about um, you know, what I'm calling for purposes of this lecture, the human imprint. So the EU communication from 2000 is particularly well known and it calls for various kinds of um, standards to be maintained. So the, it's not simply look before you leap or don't do anything. It's got a, an idea of proportionality uh, consistent with similar measures already taken and so on and so forth. And in France, contested though it be, it is in the Charter for the Environment and again uh, has had a lot of impact on the ways in which 
France, for instance, is thinking, has been thinking about nuclear risks and also the risks of some of these emerging technologies such as nanotech and now genome editing as well. Um, and it's not just in the law, you know, the formal codified law of constitutions or statute books, it's also in uh, litigation. Uh, and in the States, a major statement of this comes about uh, in 1976, which is seen as a kind of turn away from the imminence doctrine towards a more risk-based approach. Um, the ruling judge in that case said that public health may properly be found endangered both by a lesser risk of a greater harm and by a greater risk of a lesser harm, pointing the way to a kind of risk analytic approach to thinking about the problems of the Anthropocenic world. So all of this, of course, is nevertheless embedded in other social structures. So the law doesn't only give us norms for how we should be behaving in relation to nature, but also tells us who gets to control what in the process of that decision making. And again, it will be well known to many of you that the Anthropocene, according to some of its critics, should not be thought of as just a set of things that we as anthropos do to the world, but that a particular way of making growth happen, the growth that is associated with capitalism, is how we should think about the Anthropocene. And again, if we do that, we find in the domain of the law and of legally regulated public policy, all kinds of interesting commentaries on how we should think about capital formation and the exercise of capitalist power in relation to what we're doing to the environment. So here is a case that's to some degree, I think, well known still, uh, namely the 1984 chemical disaster in Bhopal. What many of you may not know is the litigation that followed about where physically in which court system uh, the repercussions of that accident ought to be tried out. And there was a very interesting decision in the American federal court saying that it should not be America. So this was an American company with an Indian subsidiary conducting business in India. Things went drastically wrong. About as many people died as in 9-11. Many more, tens of thousands more, were permanently injured. There are health effects down into the next generation. So the, in India, where industrial accidents are commonplace, you know, a person dies, five people die, maybe 20 people die, but not 3,000 at one go, not entire communities wiped out. And of course, American lawyers being ingenious animals descended on Bhopal to try to bring the litigation into the States. None of this was pretty. But people were dying, and one country had a lot more money than the other country. Uh, so there was a question where this should be litigated. And the court held not in America, partly because of um, practical reasons. The American interest in this accident is simply not sufficient to justify the enormous commitment of judicial time and resources. So what is the American interest in this accident and, what, and judicial time and resources? But then the judge went on to say that furthermore, it would be doing a disservice to India's sovereignty to have this case litigated outside of India. Um, the Union of India is a world power in 1986 and its courts have the proven capacity to meet out fair and equal justice to deprive the Indian judiciary of this opportunity to stand tall before the world and to pass judgment on behalf of its own people would be to revive a history of subservience and subjugation from which India has emerged. Uh, in all of my research, I only know of one other passage that has as many layers of deep irony to it. And it is the one involving um, gestational surrogacy in which a California court says that we would be depriving women of recently earned freedom to use their bodies to earn money if we allowed this gestational surrogate not to be paid 
for her services, but of course she could not be the mother of the child because that was not a paid thing. Anyway, so there's this same idea of the way in which the capitalist world has been constructed that allows the judge to say what the American interest is, what judicial time is worth, and I mean, you know, so don't think capital is seen as a universal thing. Think of the way in which discrepancies in the world get constructed and then overlay the Anthropocene on this. Another kind of close to home thing, some of you may know that Lawrence Summers, before he became president of Harvard, and indeed before he became treasury secretary, wrote or allowed his signature to be affixed to an infamous memo in which it was argued that it was actually better to have dirty industries and pollution shipped off to poor countries because the environmental Kuznets curve showed you that they needed the jobs and at the moment when the industries would be shipped over there, the lives would be cheaper and hence sacrificing a few more of them would allow those countries to engage in industries that they would not otherwise have had and set them on the path uh, toward um, a well-known other fact, which is that richer countries have stronger environmental laws. So this, you know, again, one doesn't know about cause and effect, but Larry Summers did not occupy the chief economist position in the World Bank long after this memo came out. Um, but it, again, it's a kind of, you know, sort of, other conversation that is going on around this idea of the, of the Anthropocene. Who can intervene? Under what circumstances? And uh, whose right is it to take the kinds of developments that we produce in this caring for technology world in which we're constantly producing new things uh, and the aftershocks, after effects, side effects of all of this. So if you ask today, where do the, what are the pollution footprints of this gadget, for instance, you would not find it mostly in America. So, you know, again, what does the, what does the flattening discourse of the Anthropocene and indeed even of the Capitalocene do for us when we're talking about lawyers and policymakers engaging in this kind of talk about temporality and about um, who needs to get brought up to speed with what, a linear notion of progress in which it's obvious who is behind, who is a, ahead, how long it will take to do the catching up. Uh, and again, a different context altogether, the debate between William Nordhaus and Nicholas Stern, both very prominent economists on the discount rate to be applied uh, in talking about climate change. But, you know, this is, again, an interesting passage from Nordhaus's account of this in Science Magazine in 2007, that philosophers and economists have conducted vigorous debates about how to apply discount rates in areas as diverse as economic growth, climate change, energy, nuclear waste, major infrastructure programs, hurricane levies, and reparations for slavery. So with the exception, arguably, of reparations for slavery, you will note that all of the other ones are about human nature relationships. And what he's saying is that philosophers and economists lodge on two sides of a binary, and he is on the descriptive approach side, as he says earlier in that same passage, uh, in which assumed discount rates should conform to actual political and economic decisions and prices. But what are these actualities? What presumptions? about the world and of property are they founded on, whereas anything else that rejects the actuality takes the prescriptive, hence philosophical, approach in the extreme. So let's switch in our turn to technology because that's the main obsession of the anthropocenic crowd. And of course, around climate, we have lots of technology. This was an image that was quite evocative that was circulated around the time of COP21. Um, uh, but, you know, it's related to other things. It's related to uh, 
the idea that the earth is an overflowing bathtub and that the correct solution is to take a wrench to it, I don't know if it's a monkey wrench or just a wrench, um, and therefore geoengineering, um, which, although it's an imaginary, as Mark Lawrence and I were discussing before this lecture, has many beautiful images already associated with it. Um, and it's interesting that, that here again, the scalar changes combine time and space in odd and interesting ways. So the anthropologist Joseph Masco, in talking about fallout, has written that geoengineering assumes a profound understanding of planetary scale ecological systems. So it's like you throw out Anthropocene and you get geoengineering echoing back. I mean, it's almost that kind of a mythic response to negotiate the cumulative uninvented environmental consequences of human industry uh, across nuclear, petrochemical, and capitalist consumption regimes. One of the ways in which we're wanting to do that uh, is not, I mean, so some of it is about capturing the carbon, some of it is about releasing carbon. Uh, so again, it's interesting if one looks at the discourse of fossil fuels just in the last, how long has it been, uh, time becomes interminable in this administration. It's uh, only about a year and a half, right? But the, but the policies have shifted. And so whereas previously we were trying to capture the carbon and put it back somewhere or to keep it from striking the Earth's surface, today we are deeply committed to finding it wherever it is and releasing it. Um, and, you know, so this is hydrofracking. And various things have been said about it, um, including something that's relevant to the geological way of thinking. So this is uh, an environmental scholar at Ithaca College who says something quite suggestive. Horizontal hydrofracking is a form of fossil fuel extraction that turns the earth inside out. It buries and brings to the surface subterranean substances, hydrocarbons, radioactive materials, heavy metals, brine, that were once locked away in deep geological strata. So apart from the imagery being, to my mind, as a Tolkien fan, reminiscent of the Balrog being released from the depths of Moria, um, this is changing geological time in an almost literal way. I mean, it's not just we've created an era, but that we've actually gone and destroyed the work of other eras, and uh, it's re-stratifying the earth upside down, inside out in some way. But who responds and from where? I mean, of course, public policymakers can say, as they have said in New York, that there won't be any fracking in New York. Um, but how did that come about? And there are layers and layers of legislation that speak in different ways to our very conflicted ideas of what capital is and what democracy is and their intention. So there's a federal preemption, which is both express and implied, saying that if there's federal and state jurisdiction, then federal law should preempt state law. And there is a specific oil and gas mining law that says that federal law shall supersede all local laws or ordinances relating to the regulation of the oil, gas, and solution mining industries. In other words, if you want to turn the earth inside out, the federal government in the US gives you carte blanche to override anything that's happening locally that might speak to a different normative understanding of which Balrogs should be kept underground and which ones should be released. So Dryden, a small town of just you know, under 2,000 people, passes a zoning law and bans all activities related to exploration for and production or storage of natural gas or petroleum, and it comes up to the courts. And the court actually decides in favor of these people by saying that this isn't a matter of regulating oil and gas solution. It has to do with issues of municipal politics, and this is the sort of demonstration that ends up carrying weight. Um, so all of this suggests that we should not be 
too willingly led down the pathway of the Anthropocene and start thinking about everything that is going on in relation to human nature changes as this other tidal wave that is not resistible and we may as well give up and, and just use our technologies more deeply, more thoroughly, more aggressively, and so on. One might then ask, what should we care about? And, of course, one can turn to a German filmmaker. Um, it's a terrible movie, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it has some interesting passages. So when they're holed up in the New York Public Library, I don't know how many other people in this audience, A, saw the movie and would be taken by what exactly Emmerich chooses to preserve. What book is that? He's clutching it. He doesn't want it to be thrown on the pyre that's going to keep them warm. The Gutenberg Bible. You think God is going to save you? No, I don't believe in God. You seem to be holding on to the book very tightly. I'm protecting it. The Bible is the first book ever published. It represents the dawn of the age of reasoning. As far as I'm concerned, the written word is mankind's greatest achievement. Laugh if you want, but if Western civilization is destroyed, I want to save one little piece of it. And then what's going to happen to us? What do you mean? I mean us, civilization, everyone. Mankind survived the last ice age. We're certainly capable of surviving this one. The only question is, will we be able to learn from our mistakes? You can put that up next to E.O. Wilson, who thinks maybe the bugs will survive. But in any case, there's a statement in pop culture that is talking about something else. Now, to, from the ridiculous to the sublime, um, Zebald thought about these issues as well, and in his On the Natural History of Destruction essay, he talks about regeneration, and at the end of the war, some of the bomb sites of Cologne, I mean, of course, Berlin has its own history with exactly these sorts of sites, had already been transformed by the dense green vegetation growing over them. The roads made their way through this new landscape, like peaceful, deep-set country lanes. In contrast to the effect of the catastrophes insidiously creeping up on us today, nature's ability to regenerate did not seem to have been impaired by the firestorms. In fact, many trees and bushes, particularly chestnuts and lilacs, had a second flowering on Hamburg in the autumn of 1943, a few months after the Great Fire. Of course, in that essay, he also talks about the human inability to talk about what happened to those cities and to write about them in compelling ways, suggesting that, at least for him, the learning of the human nature relationships was, did not come to fruition any too quickly or any too easily. And then, what should we do and what should we think about? I mean, obviously the argument I've been giving you is that we should not get seduced by grand narratives. We should in particular not get seduced by grand narratives about technology. Instead, it may be well to recover something of the modesty that democracy and science, not technology so much, have had in common and to my legal training, the common law embodies some of these ways of thinking, and they are incrementalism, provisionality, that is not taking a once for all position, skepticism, experimentalism, and then recognizing that learning itself has to be multi-sided, not waiting for the ultimate cataclysm or disaster, but from the daily experiences of dealing with things like the Dryden people who succeeded in keeping a major oil and gas development company from intruding on their turf in ways that they didn't um, want their community to go. So I'll end with an image about the climate that I find provocative and interesting that to some degree speaks of where the power to rethink the Anthropocene may lie. And that is, you know, that COP21 happened in the wake of the tragic terrorist attacks in Paris, and therefore they banned, uh, the government banned uh, large public marches. And so a creative solution was found. Um, 
And you can have lots of problems with this. I certainly do. Uh, for instance, it doesn't say anything about the barefoot people of the world and how they would be represented. But nevertheless, it is a way of rethinking the connections between politics, power, and environmental conceptions and terminologies of the sort that the Anthropocene invites us to think of and care about. So with that, let me stop. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be taking questions from here. Is this working? No. I don't think no. so. You have, oh, you have a one. So, please. There's much food for thought. Here. Well, thank you, Sheila, for that fabulous insight. Um, as you know, I've been watching the development of the Anthropocene since the beginning when Paul Crutzen spurted that uh, term out and, and started bringing it into the world. And I think this is a nice, a fascinating additional take on the breadth of issues that comes into this. I'd be curious on your take of focusing in on one. Um, you brought the Bhopal incident, incident into here very interestingly. And one of the things that really stands out to me is, is not just the challenge of the, the, the tussle over the litigation at that time, and what uh, I think your interpretation of that is really, really insightful of, of what that means about the sort of paternalistic viewpoint that was, that's taken there, but the fact that the Bhopal factory, the Union Carbide factory, is still not cleaned up. It's still, after all of this time, it's still a massive danger. And that, that it, to me, it reflects so strongly the lack of care and sense of responsibility that's felt, that's characteristic of what's brought about the Anthropocene. But you've been thinking about this in much more depth than I have from my physics background. And I'd be curious on if you could expand a little bit further in that direction. What does it mean going beyond the initial tussle and the initial challenges to the fact that it's still, it's still a mess? Yeah, well, Mark, thanks for the question. And it's a question that, you know, I mean, it's worth many books. And I mean, you could take that one episode as a starting point and you know, have an entire curriculum built around it. But one of the reasons why care was not shown and stewardship not demonstrated in a normal way is the already structured quality of American liability law. So for Union Carbide, the parent corporation, any admission that they might have been in any sense at fault was tantamount to giving up on a case and losing it before they went into the litigation itself. But this, of course, is based on American liability law, which in turn rests on a whole mess of things which are not even known in Europe. I mean, like contingency fees and a non-welfare state. I mean, right? So if you compare, for instance, as I and people around me have done, uh, what happened in the wake of asbestos which was widely used industrially and lots of people suffered, uh, even just the US-UK comparison. In the US, it became a sort of focal point of litigation that tied up, gummed up the federal courts for decades and decades. If you look at the UK, the workers didn't sue. And they were asked why they weren't suing. It was because of a set of relationships they felt with their employers, which were very different from our own much more adversarial approach. So the liability law itself is grounded in a set of understandings, understandings in part about the public-private divide and the responsibilities that go with state versus private. And that was all being overlaid, in a sense, onto the Bhopal situation in India. And of course, this is not a question of blame lying one place and not another. The Indian state was not particularly well positioned and, and did a lot of things 
wrong in the wake, wake of the Bhopal disaster as well. But the fundamental question of responsibility could not be answered in a certain way because one nation's legal system already founded on deep underlying senses of where the public-private boundary fits and what all goes along with that, colored the behavior patterns in the other context to such an extent that, you know, in effect, a resolution never, never was possible. I mean, it is interesting that this case, which has been studied, you know, more than almost any other, you could not tell a causal narrative to this day that, that would hold up. Thank you very much for the talk and for a lot of very provocative thoughts along the way. I'd like to I'd ask you to explore a little more what you showed in the penultimate slide, your last slide and stuff. You, you had the provisional and the incremental. And what I think is really interesting in, in reflecting on that um, is that the Anthropocene in some sense is, is from the beginning thought of in a global sense. And yet we have all of these examples, Bhopal is one, but there are you know, thousands of them, of where the culture, the context in, in many senses, the physical conditions, etc., mean that there isn't one response to this Anthropocene. And therefore, I think what you put there of the incremental and provisional is really key, along with yet, if you will, some way to make that coherent across the world. And I think we don't, I mean, from my point of view, I'd love to know how if you think there's a way towards that coherence out of this incremental provisional. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough question because, I mean, one can say what is not the right way, but then what is the right way is a far bigger challenge. But, you know, take climate and take carbon. I mean, somehow, because of a set of things that we can point to, among them, the structure of the IPCC and its own statement about what it does, that is, it does science that is meant to be policy relevant but not policy prescriptive, right? I mean, that is already drawing a boundary that a good STS scholar says is philosophically untenable, okay? But nevertheless, it does that. Uh, so uh, that rests on an idea of a shared thing called carbon and that we all, humanity writ large, suffers from having that much carbon in the atmosphere, which is right, as far as we know. But if you look at the ways in which humanity is contributing, I mean, this, of course, is also incredibly well known at the per capita consumption level. There's just no comparison. I mean, there's orders of magnitude difference across societies. But from the start, the idea was that we would treat carbon as an equivalency across all modes of production and build a single carbon market. I mean, that did not actually work out very well. And in fact, the world spoke back in some sense and the Paris Accord for all of its problems was I think an abandoning of the non-accord of Copenhagen, but more so a kind of rejection of a point that was made by Agarwal and Narayan way back when, when they talked about global warming and an unequal world. Because after all, what they said was, and they, they're not, they're like pragmatic co-productionists. I mean, this is a point that I want to make about social theory, that social theory is not the stuff that uh, Hobbes wrote or Habermas wrote. It's the way people live and theorize their own existence in some sense. So, what they were proposing was that carbon be tagged from the beginning by the uses to which it's put. And that, I mean, they were provocative and said it should be rich and poor, among other things, subsistence versus, you know, uh, unnecessary consumption. But I think they were calling attention to the fact that a regime built on a more hybridized understanding of 
forms of life and consequences is a more robust way of going about trying to make policy, at least at the global scale, than by saying, look, it all has to be the same thing. I mean, you know, this is also a way of understanding how, you know, liberal growth-oriented economics today is sitting around doing a certain amount of crow eating in the in the US because they didn't consider the sort of selective impacts on particular forms of life of the general proposition, which is surely right, that, you know, you open up the markets and you get cheaper goods because supply and demand work out in certain law-like ways. Um, but I think that, that it's that kind of negotiation that we have to go through all the time that, that um, I'm trying to, I mean, you know, that's what the incremental and the provisional refer to. It, it's, I mean, how does one get to a mode of global constitutionalism? And I mean, because I think climate governance or Anthropocene governance would require some concepts like that. But all robust constitutional systems I know have subsidiarity ideas built into them. That is, they don't say the same thing all the way down. They say, you know, subscribe to some meta norms, but exactly what this means, you know, I mean, to take a very immediate example, it seems to mean in America that you may choose not to bake a cake because you don't like someone's sexual preferences and don't want to celebrate their marriage, but you can make a very big fuss if people throw you out of a restaurant because they don't particularly like your views on the said cake baking. I mean, you know, so so there's not, I mean, there is not a sort of uniform common set of understandings there. It's an illustration in everyday life of the way people are negotiating out these theoretical things. I think we are scientists, you know, kind of intoxicated by our own powers of abstraction and generalization tend to forget that that's that abstraction and generalization are forms of models that only imperfectly render the complexity of the territory underneath and i think if anything what we need to do is the corrective there you know that is put it more in conversation really ask you know what would ground truth thing look like for this proposition Thank you very much. Uh, a very inspiring talk. I want to ask you a little bit about the emphasis that you gave in your talk to law and technology, and if you could probably specify that a little bit more in relation to, because I think I was quite struck in the way in which you are talking about technology as the big engineering technology and the issues that come about with it, and I was kind of expecting that you would say more about social engineering in relation to it and the way in which micromanagement is done which also can be done with technology and the material implications that it brings about in relation to law that always seems to be much more a reaction rather than an action when it comes to these big issues. And the second thing I would like you to elaborate a little bit more is this way in which in these discourses, both when related to technology and law, you see people uh, operating with the question of scale. So what they are doing and how they are doing it, and on which scale that actually can come, become effective. Thank you. Um, well, a couple of responses which um, will undoubtedly be too superficial for your question, but at least they're starting points. So first of all, to start with the question of scale, uh, I am a constructivist theorist uh, and think that scale is what we make it to be. I mean, that is, it's not that something is intrinsically this or that, <coughs> but that using our tools, which happen to be in some sense engineering tools, we manufacture scale. I mean, in a sense, what I was saying before about constitutional systems, I mean, you know, you can say this is operating at the level of the nation state, but when you look more deeply, you will find that it's not operating in the same way at the nation state level, that there's all kinds of disparities and regional differences and people are doing all kinds of things underneath. So in a way, it's a disciplinary question, like at which scale do your tools allow you to look at something? 
you know, there are people who believe that society is the aggregate of individuals and that's all there is to it. And there are people who believe that no, there's a separate analytic domain of the intersubjective, which is a collective projection that cannot be got at, just cannot adequately be got at through just the summing up of the individuals. And depending on where you sit in disciplinary terms, you may have different ideas about all of that. I do think, in my terms, that law itself is a technological system and has many of the same complexities that engineering technology also has. Uh, and part of what I was trying to suggest is that the Anthropocene has been talked about as if human beings only make one kind of technological intervention, the material kind, whereas, of course, they're making social kinds that also have very material consequences and implications and starting points in histories as well. So, for instance, something like the public-private divide, which affects all questions of responsibility, or what do we think of as property and what do we think of as nature, which again affects many of the things that we might be doing here. That is a matter of legal dispensations to some extent, which are arbitrary. They're things that we you know, chose to make into the world in a, in a certain sense. I mean, there's no a priori reason why the Gulf states should be the richest ones ever because some historical accidents of little states being created late in the 20th century went hand in hand with what? Divine dispensation that a territorial map corresponds to everything under it? I mean, you know, where did that actually come from? But if you think of law as also an engineering system in a sense, then I think that the third point of yours that I'll address quickly doesn't really hold up. I mean, so it's not that law is only backward, or, you know, somehow trying to catch up or, or lagging behind or, or only able to do, deal with things when they, you know, become mature in some sense. It looks that way because legal institutions are activated when people are fighting, and then it seems as though it's reactive. But it's long histories of actually having established things to be the way they are, such that these controversies arise in the first place. So I think that looking at the imminence of law and its you know, sort of always already character of being present uh, would allow us to think more about the universal, seeming universalism of the material technologies, because actually neither is universal in that sense. I mean, both bear critical exploration of how each shores up the authority of the other to look authoritative, to look universal, and, and to look scalar at certain kinds of scales. Hi. <clears throat> Is this on now? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I really enjoyed that, and I, I appreciate your drawing our attention to the legal side of things. And on that note, um, so probably most people in this room know of the Steven Spielberg movie uh, based on a Philip K. Dick novel, Minority Report, in which the idea of pre-crime is presented. Tom Cruise in the movie is a detective who investigates crimes before they happen. And this, this idea has come up some in the conversations around big data because people are concerned that algorithms are going to be you know, generating predictions about people that are going to be le legally acted upon. But it occurs to me, actually, that a case where pre-crime perhaps applies even more directly is in thinking about the legal framework around preventing some of the risks that are predicted in the Anthropocene. Um, and thinking back to your, your example of 1880, whenever that was, um, the, the judge passing the buck basically because the time scale is just simply too far. Well, now we're talking about a, a really long time scale. Um, and I remember back in the, in the mid 80s, um, Jonathan Schell in The Fate of the Earth described the extinction of, of the human species through nuclear war as a crime against the future, right? And, and, and it does seem in, in many ways, if we're thinking in a, in a kind of a legalistic sense about what some of the interventions that humans are making on the, on the globe today, um, uh, the catastrophic implications that might not play out for 50, 100, 200, 1,000 years, um, that these are in, in many ways crimes against the future and, and because our ability to understand precisely what those effects will be are in many ways based on 
on predictions, climate models, all kinds of things. Um, they, you know, they, they can't have the kind of concreteness and certainty. I mean, so it really is a kind of a minority report situation. So how, how, how should we address that? How, how can we develop a legal framework for essentially crimes against the future that are, that are based on predictions? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting set of reflections and certainly thinking about climate modeling, which is an exercise in big data mining, though that's not the terminology in which people talk about it, as pre-crime detection uh, is interesting. You may have noticed in the last day or two, people are talking about, you know, why the ozone hole is growing again and where the, and the last stories or that the culprit is thought to be China in some way, but they don't yet quite know what kind of manufacturer. But there's a place where your pre-crime detection, et cetera, I mean, that analogy uh, holds up quite nicely, I would say. And on the basis of, you know, large signal gathering and comparing signal and noise in, in interesting ways. So <clears throat> you could, I suppose, think about all um, risk regulation as to some extent an attempt to ward off uh, future uh, crime scenes uh, because we already have signals uh, that are, are going in that, uh, that are pointing in that direction. Um, and you could take something like, I mean, so all of my chemicals interested friends in Europe are suddenly talking about glyphosate and the problems that the EU has been having deciding, you know, how to negotiate in part between France and Germany, in part between the US and and Europe on, on what to do with glyphosate. And it's interesting that one way they've chosen to approach it is by creating an ad hoc time limit by regulating it, by allowing it on the market for five years and not the standard, what, 15 or whatever it would have been in order to buy time, in a sense, for additional data to accrue. So one kind of answer is if you take the provisionality seriously and if you take the necessary uncertainties in the big data models also seriously, because surely the algorithms there are every bit as imperfect as algorithms anywhere, then a kind of policy approach might be to act much more incremental proceeding on, on those kinds of presumptions. Um, but that doesn't get one off the hook on, I mean, it may say something about timing. It may say, I mean, again, if you're sort of familiar with environmental law and tort law, you know that a lot of the ingenuity of the legal system has gone into exactly those sorts of negotiations. How much variation of response do you allow inside of a community? Because not everybody can meet a standard at the same time. Are you draconian and drive people out of business? Or do you say you'll give them 20 years to come up to speed? Um, and then what do you do if you if it turns out they've installed defeat devices in their cars and are telling you one thing, and it really was another thing. So, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of experience that we have in uh, regulatory systems for creative ways in which one can respond to the sort of, uh, the uncertainties of that pre-criminal state. Uh, and of course, there are analogies with mental states as well. I mean, you know, do you lock up a person for life because your, your big data analysis has shown that this person for sure is going to be a threat to humanity or not? And I think that it's human or not doesn't make a difference. The principles could apply in the same way. But Finally, you know, this crime against the future, but what is a crime against the future? A crime against the human future, with us making as many billions of people as we want, or a crime against E.O. Wilson's future, which is the future of insect-led stability, <laughs> and it doesn't matter where the humans go. Um, you know, I, I think that what is needful is a discussion of what the future is against which the crime is to be defined. And I think that the way this relates to the sorts of things I'm talking about is that as scientists, we get so fixated on the accuracy of the prediction that we forget 
What is it we're trying to predict? What is it we're trying to prevent? What is it we're trying to ban or prohibit? That discussion gets sidelined, and sometimes the present is taken as the standard. So it's obviously this moment in time that we're trying to make, you know, the status quo thing. I mean, sometimes when I talk about these things, I show a very interesting interview that Bill Gates gave. Again, it was around the time of the Paris meeting to Andrew Revkin, the, the environmental journalist who used to write for the Times and now is an independent blogger. And it was about Gates's belief in moonshots, the once for all solutions. And he segues into talking about how, you know, you may think that that incremental solutions are okay, and if, if you do, you know, fine, go do it. Of course, I, Microsoft, knew that, you know, incremental solutions are for weaklings and losers, uh, you know. Uh, but in passing, he says, you know, for Indians to live even a little bit like the way we live, you need a moonshot, something like that. Um, but it's obvious in the discourse that this is the linear progress narrative. It's obvious where Nirvana is and everybody else has to come up to that. So I'm a little skeptical of your crime against the future because I don't know what future or whose future is being talked about that we are being, that we're convicting people about. Well, there is one more question. I think there is time. Okay, time for, oh my God, now, now you start. <laughs> Time for three more questions, and that's it. Because you there is a light reception and some wine, even on behalf of the groups of epistemes of modern acoustics. So we we can continue the conversation later. But three questions. Thanks. Can I them? Yes, please collect them. Hi, Sheila. Um, Hi, Ian Gray from UCLA. Uh, I appreciated the the talk immensely, um, and I kind of wanted to bring it back to um, the question of law, which is. I guess is what we've been kind of discussing here recently. So on the point of whether the law is kind of reactive or always reactive, I think we're seeing a number of cases in the US particularly that are very um, proactive and kind of strategically experimental. Um, and I, I'd like to get your thoughts on some of these. And so we're seeing both um, at, at the attorney general level, um, for instance, in New York and Massachusetts, uh, these cases against ExxonMobil and some other um, oil companies around securities fraud. Um, and the argument similar in the tobacco case is that they you know, knew, knew that climate change was uh, a huge detriment to health and society, and they hid the science that they'd already discovered. And so um, we've seen those kind of things succeed in some cases and also fail um, in other cases, like in the asbestos cases, they've been kind of weak, but in tobacco, they've been kind of successful. We're also seeing cities um, around the US uh, launch lawsuits as kind of collective um, action cases, class action cases against a bunch of oil companies. And a lot of that argument kind of hinges, at least from the oil company's point of view, on causality. And how can you argue that these few oil companies are responsible for you know, the, the immensity of, of, of the climate problem. So, so that's a kind of a different set of cases. And then you also see, I think, maybe to me the most interesting one that I've seen is um, the uh, California Coastal Commission against versus Lynch um, in California that went to the state Supreme Court in California around the right to build um, seawalls defending private property um, on the coast of, of California cities. And the Coastal Commission has this um, prerogative to protect the coastline and the beaches for all of Californians. And they also have the, the power to deny or um, provide permits. And so the, the state Supreme Court decided very narrowly on this case, um, but it's, it's kind of a separate case, more on the, on the issue of kind of retreat and um, the, the property and public divide that you, you mentioned. So um, I wonder if you could kind of um, maybe say your point of view on these assemblage of cases. And I, I don't take you to be a legal pessimist, um, but do you think you're a legal optimist in, in, some, of these, uh, in some of these cases? Let me, let me collect the three. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your good talk. Uh, I have a really uh, naive amateur question. Uh, when I look back to the last slide of your presentation and I remind the word modesty and learning, it reminds me to the research work, work, sorry, to the research work of Donna Ahawe. And I wanted to know if you felt uh, connected to some of her ideas or not, and um, why. Yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, I like to uh, structure my mind uh, using social ecological systems as a concept. And uh, well, they typically come with subsystems like the nature, the natural system, economic system, legal system, and political system. And thanks for your talk because it inspired quite a lot uh, uh, in me. Because I think the, the vision that you give of the legal system, of this incremental approach, I think nicely resonates with the Paris approach in climate policy. And I think this is something that we should look deeper into and the repercussions of the subsystems and how they can basically get into resonance. Yep. Yeah, so I think that the, I mean, to take them in backward order, the subsystems and, and incrementalism approach. I mean, I think it goes back to your question in part as well of how does one construct big things. And I think that big things often are modularized. And, you know, so I think you're calling attention to that and, you know, having a very um, uh, rigid internal structure is often less instructive in various ways than having lots of subsystems in which periodic stabilizations nevertheless happen and then, then they can get linked up in, in different ways to create things. That's very abstract and I think that the where the learning would have to happen is uh, you know taking these different systems seriously. I mean I'm saying after all that People are used to thinking about technology and used to thinking that humans intervene in nature through technologies, but people operate with a very materialist sense of technologies in their heads. And if they would also see economics as a technology and law as a technology and sort of look at the interpenetration of these things, you know, maybe one gets too luminesque and systemic. But nevertheless, I think that, that there's something to be uh, said and thought there. Um, your question about Haraway, I mean, obviously you're thinking of modest witness and the fact that she uses the term modest. I mean, you know, anybody in STS is obviously deeply aware of Haraway and her, in particular her idea of situated knowledges has been very um, um, instructive and important because, again, it suggests one of these ways of building collective understandings that doesn't have to subscribe to a single axiomatic universal proposition but can grow from the bottom up to some extent. I think the place where the way I think resonates most with the way in which Haraway thinks is about the points of view from which witnessing happens and this, uh, the difference between creating a collective through a view from nowhere gaze, which presumes that there's some place you can go that is outside of situatedness, uh, where I don't believe you can and she doesn't believe you can, but there's other ways of creating universalisms which could be built from the different views from somewhere that are all situated in their own terms but can nevertheless agree on various things, which arguably was the Paris Accord type of model. And then, Ian, your point about law, I'm not going to uh, please you by actually talking about these different cases, but to point out that one reason they are collective in your mind is that they're doing something that the law is very good at doing, which is reframing. Now, material technologies also reframe. I mean, so social media have reframed the idea of friendship, as some of us were discussing a little while ago, uh, and you can be, you can withhold judgment on whether friendship is more meaningful or less meaningful when you do that. But in any case, the point is that all of the cases you describe, the success or failure has to do with whether you can take something that was understood in one sort of way and turn it into something else. So securities fraud and Exxon, because they misstated the value of their shares, because they knew stuff that if they had disclosed it would have redounded 
to the negative appreciation of those shares is a way in which the law comes in and says, look, you guys have always thought about it in this way. Now I'm going to show you how it works in a different way. So, you know, when the American Civil Liberties Union says we are going to find civil liberties in intellectual property law on human genes, it is a reframing exercise because the ACLU had never thought about genetics as being part of civil liberties. But now, from henceforth, people have a wider understanding of how civil liberties can come to be lodged in something as arcane as intellectual property law. So I think that the reason why, I mean, you know, few people have attached the word optimist to me, but why I still think that engagement is something I believe in and think that people ought to pursue, even if it's a losing battle, um, you know, is that I think that the law offers among other things, a place of imagination, a place of creativity. And we destroy that creativity with narratives like law lag, where suddenly technology is the only place where disruption, creativity, and the new can come about. And, you know, I think that it's interesting that when Time magazine, I think, was looking for its people of the century, they picked Einstein and Gandhi, um, because Gandhi was an inventor too and a reframer, and it's not obvious that nonviolence was a lesser invention than some of the other inventions, such as the internet. So, you know, it's more a matter of keeping multiple options for, you know, reflecting on the human condition alive that I want to, you know, stand for at the end of the day. Wonderful, so thank you very much. Thank you.